<laughs> the more I step back and look at this movement in historical context, the more excited I get for the prospects of our future. And if you look at where we are today, I think Anarchapulco is a brilliant manifestation of the growth of this movement. And I like to play a little game called libertarian fantasy math, where we try to guess how many of us there are in America. But no matter how you come to any kind of number that you want to put on it, it's impossible to not look back in history and see that we have grown from even just a few decades ago, where we were such a small movement that when you woke up, you would feel very alone. And it was a scary world to think that you were the only one who understood what reality was. And yet we can see over time that not only has this movement grown, but it has grown exponentially. And that is manifested here in this conference. But you know that what we are doing is much more evolutionary than revolutionary. We use the term waking up. I think it's a, it's a very imprecise way to describe what we're talking about. Because when we talk about waking up, it's impossible to go back to sleep. I like to say we have a very high retention rate, something over 99%. And when you look at that and you step back, it resolves so much of the fear and anxiety that we might feel in the present day and the struggle and the fight and challenging the state and taking it on. And you get to see this as part of the beautiful dance forward of humanity. And it doesn't take very long to realize that the achievement of freedom for the entire human family is inevitable. And boy, oh boy, do I get a good feeling about that here with the Anarchapulco community. And to see that we have grown threefold just since last year. And I hope those of you who are new can appreciate what kind of community and family that we have around this conference in particular. So I'd like to say thank you to Avi and Nathan and Jeffrey and everybody else who's made this event possible. So I have to have a bit of a special thank you in this for Nathan for making it possible for me to bring a special guest here today. And I'm more than happy to, to give up the primary part of my speaking time to be able to introduce someone to this community who's in a sense been in a, a kind of political exile for the last decade. So yeah, uh, Terry likes to drop names, doesn't he? <laughs> Cynthia McKinney is here today. And I want to make, yeah, give it up for Cynthia McKinney. She knows, she knows she's in the right place. Now, so what we're going to do today, we have uh, my amazing girlfriend Stacy and my head of security Elijah here, and they have note cards. So we're going to pass those out. Go ahead and, and pass these out. We want, I want to make this, uh, was, it was Cynthia's idea to call it political speed dating. So we're going to do some version of that. We want your help. If you can write down questions that you want asked of, of myself, or most especially of Cynthia McKinney, things that you want to make her, uh, you know, feel welcome in this community as well. But um, before, I, before I properly introduce her as the hero who she is to me, uh, with the Kokesh for President campaign, I get the same kind of encouragement when I travel to the United States and I ask people, hey, would you support dissolving the entire federal government? If you could have nobody for president, would that be an option than one of these old party crooks? And they go, yeah, present me with a credible plan, and I would totally vote for that. And I think that similar to the message of freedom itself, that's the kind of thing you don't go back to sleep from. And I'm going to come back when, when we're done with this and talk a little bit about localization and how that unites people. But first, just this one administrative note, because some people have come up and asked me, hey, Adam, when are you talking? All I see is this thing with Cynthia on the schedule. We've decided, and, and jointly, we're going to host two other events. So tonight, Anarcha Poker. I know some people are really excited about that. Wait, maybe not, no poker players here? Anybody? All right. So that's tonight at 8 o'clock. And from the link on the flyers that are on everybody's seats, or should have been at some point, 
and you can find the directions to get there. And there is a buy-in, but I've never been to a single libertarian-oriented event that you couldn't sneak into, <laughs> mine included. So if you don't want to play cards, you just want to come hang out, you want to get into all the stuff that we have going on with the campaign, with the arrest, with the tour, with the war memoir, with the freedom book drops, with the delegates, with rooting out the corruption in the LP, with uh, bringing blockchain voting technology to the LP, please come, just, uh, come on later, join us tonight. And then if you want to join both of us for a fundraiser tomorrow, we're doing mimosas for freedom for brunch. And now I get to turn it over, well, I get to properly introduce someone who, who really is a hero of mine. And, and I... I I always get apprehensive when people apply that term to me, and I, and I feel that it, it, it has to be justified in a way. If you're going to use that word, like, you know, really, it can't be like, oh, I, I saw that YouTube video, you're a hero. No, like, it really has to come from the heart. It has to come from a place that's much more meaningful than that. And a, a quick examination of Cynthia's resume should invoke that in all of you, if you care about freedom. She was first elected to Congress as a Democrat in 1992. She was re-elected five times despite being a major pain in the butt of the establishment on all sides in Washington, D.C. It's actually really, really awesome to hear you now talk about how much she hates the Democratic Party. And it's funny because it's, it's like she hates them way more than the Republicans, although she, they're both worthy of plenty of disdain. She was the leading critic of the Bush administration in Congress. There's video of her, you can look this up. On September 10th, 2001, floor Congress asking Donald Rumsfeld about the missing $3 trillion. She was the first member of Congress and really the only one to do it in any kind of meaningful, serious manner, to question the government narrative of 9-11. Yeah. And while I was asleep in Iraq in 2004, she was standing on principle, standing on righteousness, standing up for what she believed in, taking all the risks as a member of Congress that that entails to stand up for justice. And I, I like to say that, you know, well, I guess I should, before, I, before I wrap this up, one other thing that I think is just an, an, a very important bullet point of, of her resume that actually was important for me in 2008, she was the Green Party nominee for President of the United States, and along with Chuck Baldwin and Ralph Nader, was endorsed by Dr. Ron Paul. And that was the point at which I started waking up. And even back then, her run was an inspiration to me, and of course, at that time, if you recall, there was one name missing from that list for the LP, Bob Barr. Thank you. Just waiting for the booze. All right. Given that he was the LP nominee, it was a very easy thing for me as a resident in Washington, D.C. to actually cast a vote for Cynthia McKinney in 2008. And what I think unites this family at Anarchapulco especially, why this is such a unique, powerful community, is a work community of activists. And to me, an activist is someone who is motivated by a deep-seated sense of injustice, that you see that in the world and it's not enough to understand it, it's not enough to opt out, you have to confront it, to move ever more boldly against evil. Yeah. And Cynthia McKinney is not just an activist, she is a hero to activists. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Cynthia McKinney. so much and thank you for the very warm welcome here in Anarchapulco 
And I'm wondering when my journey to Anarchapulco began. So let me get my slides up here. Oh, they are up there. <laughs> okay. And um, so it began in 2012 when Adam and I did an interview together. And you could say it was not adversarial, but it was definitely thought-provoking for me. <laughs> it was kind of like paradigm shifting. But then the next thing happened, which I'm pressing, was in the same year, my son declared he came out of the closet as an anarchist. <laughs> and he wrote a paper for the anarchist library, an anarchist theory of criminal justice. Then next, okay. Then in 2015, I got my PhD and I was asked to teach political science. I teach a lot more than political science, but in the political science department, I teach undergraduate students about different political systems. And so uh, they have all been told that indirect democracy is the best thing since sliced bread. And I have to tell them that there are some problems with indirect democracy. I teach them that the authority must be in the hands of the people. I also teach them a concept called cacistocracy. And after, well, cacistocracy, as you can see from the definition, is what we probably globally have been saddled with, and that is the government by the most corrupt, the least qualified individuals. They are the ones that are somehow in this political structure called indirect democracy are able to rise to the top. Now, as a result of Anarchapoco, I have a new uh, system that I need to teach to them, a new concept, which is psychopathocracy. <laughs> but I also teach, so I, I'm very clear to my students that I favor direct democracy, but I also teach them anarchy. <laughs> so, um, Nigel Farage of Brexit fame has now declared the UKIP platform will be for direct democracy. In Ireland, there's a direct democracy party and they are trying to reinstitute direct democracy in Ireland. Basically, what I teach my students is that they are sovereign individuals and that all power <laughs> resides with them. So, Adam invited me to the Anarchapoco party and I am ready to dance. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys can keep the questions coming. Stacy and Elijah will be uh, circulating and uh, getting them up to us here. So, well, the first one is for me, so I'm going to skip it. No, do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, actually, there's, there's one part of, of Cynthia's story, as, as I mentioned only just very briefly, that this next one touches on was that, that political exile of the last 10 years. And uh, this question from AW is, what are you doing to ameliorate the outrage you have been experiencing the last 10 years? Wow. <laughs> well, um, I think on day one, there were a lot of people who talked about working on themselves. And so I did the same thing. I have always tried to have a very academic, scholarly approach to my work, but that never came across on Fox and CNN. And so I became a caricature of myself, and it was very hurtful 
to my parents to, to witness what happened to me uh, during that time. I also challenged DynCor on the trafficking of women and little girls. And so um, in 2016, when Trump ran, he was saying all of the things that I had been trying to convey. I didn't have a billion dollars to back me up. And uh, so, you know, and I'm just this girl from the South who is not supposed to challenge power. Yes, I, <laughs> yay for the South. <laughs> the South has risen again. <laughs> So I've just worked on myself and tried to find peace knowing that some, at some point the truth uh, would catch up with those who were waking up. How many times must a cannonball fire before they're forever banned? That's right. That's right. The answer, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think there's the serious question behind this is, you know, have, are, we, are we on the verge of a world without war? I'd, and I'd like to think we're pretty close, and I think you have a, maybe a better historical perspective to answer that question. And I always cite uh, Harvard professor Steven Pinker's work, where he shows that humanity is experiencing a, a, a long-term historical decline in violence, that that is the course of human progress to get less violent over time, and that they have to resort to worse excuses for smaller wars. But can you well. speak to what you see as maybe the, the universality? I mean, when, when Ron Paul endorsed the independent candidates in 2008, it was because they were all consistently principled and anti-war, unlike the yeah. duopoly. No kidding, right? So. Well, the problem is that literally right now, as Adam and I speak here, the United States is bombing Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Yemen, Somalia, has split Sudan, has totally destroyed Libya. So I don't see a decrease in violence. What I see is the perpetuation of violence, whether it's led by Democrats or led by Republicans. Do you see anything to be hopeful, just in the fact that in 2008 you had that strong slate, that people are waking up? People are waking up. Um, we need critical mass. And so, therefore, we need you guys to go out there into the hinterlands and the motherland of the United States and, and shout this message about what real liberty and freedom mean, but for everybody, starting with the United States, because the United States, it, quite frankly, unfortunately, we pay for a lot of the world's problems. So we've got a, st I, one of the speakers on day one said, stop paying income taxes. That's one advantage of living overseas. <laughs> All right, for Cynthia, can you address the current state of politics, Zionism, and the New World Order? Well, um, I think it's a lot easier to talk about the Israeli aggressions in West Asia and in North Africa and the influence that the pro-Israel lobby has on U.S. policy. Of course, I was talking about it in 1992 because I refused to go along with the program and of course that was part of my problem. Even though I was staunchly anti-war, uh, I didn't come up to snuff because I didn't have the comma and the but behind it. So I don't want anybody to die under any bombs. And by the way, when President Obama started bombing Libya, I went to Libya. So I experienced 89 bombs dropping in Tripoli in one day. I experienced that. I tasted the grit in my mouth and the, uh, I wore contact lenses at the time, and uh, the, the, the dust and the dirt um, from those bombs in my contact lenses. Um, so that's not something that we should be giving more money to a Pentagon that loses. They don't lose the money. They give the money, and then they don't want us, we the people, to know what, where the money went. I would only just add one thing to that to say that 
the whole Russia collusion, Russia gate, what, what was that? <laughs> Thank you, yes. Is designed to keep you from paying attention to the collusion with the state of Israel. This next card has two questions, and the first one's we're going to make a throwaway. It's which YouTube interviewer do you like the most and why? <laughs> okay. Do you think that Donald will release the 9-11 papers? Well, you know, this is very interesting. The... Yes, you're right, we don't know yet. But one thing we do know is that on September 11th, 2001, Donald Trump gave a very insightful interview. And if you haven't seen it, you should look at it. Because he said there must have been explosions or something in that building because he understood the specifications to which the building had been constructed. I guess this is, if, if I may just on that too, it's kind of a bigger question about Donald Trump presenting himself as an outsider. Do you have any hope that he's actually going to live up to that? I mean, I hate to be the one saying, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so over and over again with Donald Trump. You know, he's not going to drain the swamp. He's going to unleash it in foreign policy. He's not going to build a wall. He's going to talk about amnesty. You know, he's, everything, you know, even about 9-11, you know, mm -hmm. he's been in office for a whole year. Given what you know of the power dynamics for that office, do you think he's going to be able to buck all those bigger pressure, pressures on him that are keeping him from perhaps speaking his heart as we would hope it is? Well, I posted something on my Facebook page. Um, basically, well, you're right. He hasn't drained the swamp. He's added more swamp monsters. Um, but he did give us language. We know the system is rigged. We know fake news. These are tools that we didn't have even four or five years ago, and we, we have that now. Well, he, he could drain the swamp. He could challenge the deep state. I'm very proud to um, mention the fact that the professor who actually coined the phrase deep state served on my dissertation committee, that's Dr. Peter Dale Scott. So, yes, give him applause. So I've done a lot of studying in the deep state, and uh, quite frankly, there is an opportunity here. But there are also these mechanisms that are used to compromise good people in Washington. And so, uh, if he's compromised, then he'll do nothing. And I think we will be able to tell, as time goes, um, how compromised Donald Trump is. Well, that's a perfect segue to the next question. Are there any elected officials we can trust? <laughs> Rand actually um, is doing an, a fantastic job. Now, I don't agree with the nuclear option because the tool of the filibuster, which was used so ignominiously in the 1960s, can be used by those of us who are anti-war if we happen to be in the U.S. Senate. So I would love to have, say for example, even from this conference, I would love to have the presenters at this conference inside the United States Congress doing the filibustering, putting the holes on bills, and taking a stand to end at least the war machine. If we can deal with that part, then I'm absolutely confident that we can deal with the rest. <laughs> what news sources do you suggest? News. Okay, so what I would teach my, the congressional staff 
um, and now I teach my students, is that in order to really understand what's happening around us, we have to be able to see the invisible. We have to hear the unspoken. And we have to be able to read the unwritten. Now, what exactly does that mean? That means we have to read everything. And we have to study everything in order to understand what's not there. And this is called the Peter Dale Scott methodology and how he has been able to come up with so many revelations about what happened on September 11th and also what happened on November 22nd, 1963, by understanding what was not there. And that's what we have to do. So I recommend all sources, but understand what happens on page two of any publication, and that is who owns it. So then you understand the bias that's associated with that publication. And from there, then you know why certain headlines are the way they are and what is not there. And you can do that by comparing what's there. U.S. sources as well as international sources. After I left the USA, I felt more free. Do you also feel more free outside? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I feel loved. I feel appreciated. I feel that I can walk in my skin with dignity. Um, yes, I feel liberated. I know what freedom is now. <laughs> All right, I'll take one now. To Adam, <laughs> from Shane. Can you speak upon child enslavement, sexual abuse, and satanic rituals and hierarchy cabals related to political figures, Hollywood, and economic elites? Mm. <laughs> well, one of the things that I've learned more recently is that there really is a, a significant problem with human trafficking, and a lot of it is uh, around child trafficking. And, and I say recently because it's not you know, a, a hot button issue for libertarians so much because it's often one that triggers, and well, that's why we need the state to protect us from those evil people. And I, I think that is, that's, that's a major issue that is really coming into the fore right now. And I'm really glad that we're living in a world where we can understand how statism makes that possible and how a voluntary society would deal with it far better. But as to the other things, Sexual abuse, satanic rituals, hierarchy cabals related to political figures, uh, Hollywood and the economic elites. First of all, I've, I declared a, a personal boycott on Hollywood 10 years ago. I refuse to pay in a theater for any movie that comes out of Hollywood. <laughs> but as for the rest of these, these are distraction issues. Just because, because there are... No, I'm, I'm serious, and I, I know you might say, oh, pedophilia in, in the elites in, in Washington, D.C., that's, that's the most offensive crime possible. I'm not so worried about the individual crimes that those people commit in their personal lives so much as the crimes that they commit around the world with impunity in the name of government, and those are the ones that I'm most concerned about, and that's why uniting people around the anti-war issues about getting past militarism, that is what I think is the greatest priority in confronting the state. Well, I do need to make a comment here because uh, many of the people who are trafficked are those who are the worst off in their societies. And um, we're talking about women and children, and I've I've seen, I'm in Bangladesh, which is an epicenter for human trafficking. And um, when I was in, you know, I was in prison in um, Israel. It's the only time I've been arrested. Um, and when I was in prison, I was with women who had come into the country because they thought that they were going to get a better shake out of life. Anyway, I am not going to say that any child who is damaged by a predator is 
that's a not important crime. That is a crime, and it needs to be prosecuted. And of course, the same goes for women who are held as basically sex slaves, and this happens all over the world. But unfortunately, it happens a lot with one of the greatest allies of the U.S., and that's Saudi Arabia. I'm really glad we got this next question because it goes back to your experience uh, in Congress. Can you say what are the mechanisms used to compromise good people in Washington? If so, what are they? Okay. Well, of course, when I was in Congress, the story goes, you, you know the story about the pledge. So that's one minor um, compromise that candidates for Congress are asked to make in order to get money for their campaigns. Then after the candidate becomes an incumbent, what happens in Washington is that you leave your family and you leave your home and you go to Washington, D.C. Now people, are, people just get lonely. And when you're lonely, and of course, psychological profiles are done by the CAA on all of them. And so uh, when you're lonely, that's when you can make mistakes. And uh, there's a poker game. <laughs> we can all go to Las Vegas. I never did this, by the way. But we can all go to Las Vegas. I was asked many times to go and do those things. Um, but I just never did. But how many people have the courage or the stamina to say no? So they go and then they engage in certain actions. Uh, you can see, if you follow me on Facebook, Cynthia McKinney Official, then you'll see a lot of some of the things that I post. But there was one congresswoman in particular who was compromised in a very sordid, ugly, nasty way. And when I went to her and I said, you know, I, I really don't like this place and I don't like the leadership. And, and then she said, she turned around to me and she said, yeah, they make you do things you would never do, but just so that you can get in good with them. And then there was another congresswoman who told me, Cynthia, you just have to accept that if the leadership asks us to do something, we're going to do it. So forget about their constituents. Forget about the people. Forget about the good of the country. If the leadership, and at that time, the reference was being made to Nancy Pelosi. If Nancy Pelosi says, you do this, then everybody is going to fall in line. So what I say is that we need to sweep Washington, D.C. clean. And I can't think of anybody better than the people here at Anarchapulco. You guys run for office, win, and then make a difference. I know, I know, I know, but still. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate more on the connection between anarchy and direct democracy? Okay, so the way I do uh, with my students is I have this chart that was actually done by a team of high school teachers. And it's a political system chart. So it starts on the left with, and it says, who is in charge? One person? Well, actually, no one, and that's anarchy. One person, that's authoritarianism or dictatorship. Um, or monarchy, they're all, all these different. And uh, then a few, that is a, a, a junta, if it's a military, oligarchy. And then it has all. Now, the, the distinction that I felt that I had to make with my students is because theoretically under indirect democracy, 
is still democracy and everyone is supposed to be in charge. But actually what happens is that we give up our individual sovereignty and give it over to somebody else and then we end up begging them to do the right thing, which doesn't make any bit of sense, but it makes all the sense in the world if you say, for an example, are, um, say, Bangladesh, 168 million people, but they only have 400 people leading the government. If you're the United States and you want to put a military base on the island in the Bay of Bengal, as the United States has requested, then all they have to do is purchase health of the 400 people, half plus one, of the 400 people who are in charge. So indirect democracy makes it really easy for predator states to come in and take over whole countries. But imagine if the United States or any other predator state had to deal with 168 million people. It would be an entirely different scenario. The cost to those predators goes up and so, um, what the, the uh, so that's why I, you know, I have I made the leap to I am a, an anarchist. I think I am. Can you see any foreseeable possibility to end the terrible suffering of the Palestinians? Mm. That's a tough question. Um, yes, I do foresee the possibility. As you all are probably aware, Netanyahu has just been indicted for uh, corruption. <laughs> um, so, the uh, Gilad Atzman, it's hard to say, well, you know, I really don't know the answer to that question, but Gilad Atzman has written a book, Being in Time. And I wrote the, what should have been the postscript, it ended up being the foreword to his book. But I think if we have people like Gilad who are questioning the policies of the state of Israel, um, and I've met some extremely courageous, and by the way, one of the criticisms that was launched against me was that I was hanging out with the wrong Jews. And that's because I, my friends were, um, Jews for peace, not in my name, um, uh, women in black, all of the anti-war, pro-justice organizations that happen to also be Jewish, but I was criticized by the Anti-Defamation League for associating with them. And of course, now they've been put on the list and they can't even code pink, can't even go into Israel now. Uh, I can't either because I was deported. So um, is there hope? Yes, there is hope. I was able to get into Gaza for 24 hours, and there was a wedding ceremony taking place when we were entering, and that showed me that there was love and there was life and the indomitable human spirit still in Gaza amidst all of the rubble. So yes, as long as there is life, there is hope. My experience is that we are all slaves of corrupt language. Mm. The government and justice systems do not have to carry out our wishes because we use their fraud language to make mm. our claims. What, if any, remedy do you have for this problem? Hmm. Well, like I said, um, Trump gave us some good language. The Occupy movement gave us some good language. So uh, uh, whoever wrote the question has a point that we also need to be very careful about the words that we use and the language we use and don't give power 
to the negative language of oppression and domination of the cacistocracy <laughs> or the psychopathocracy. And, and I'll just say one more thing on that that I, I think is really important in the, in the way that we just amongst ourselves talk about government. And especially in the United States, we are really suckers, I, even among this community, because we can tell that this language is something that we have to make a del deliberate effort to break our habits in. But we are such suckers for the propaganda that has us identify with the government that even people who weren't alive at the time say, well, when we were in World War II, you know, and it's like nationalism, you know, making you take credit for things that you had nothing to do with and hate people who you've never met. And mm -hmm. just using that honest language to never say we when we talk about the government, I think that's yeah. the single most important thing in changing our language. Yeah. All right, we only got a few minutes left, but we got, I got to go to this awesome one from Kate from San Francisco, which includes a, a crying face here, and it says, how can we get rid of Nancy Pelosi? <laughs> there is so much money invested to ensure entrenchment, also much yes, fear right. amongst local reps to speak against her. Why? Well, she has the power of deciding what committees members uh, are assigned. And for some members of Congress, you know, um, they view these committees as life and death. And in some respects, that's correct. Because the committees are broken down, that's a money committee. And if you serve on a money committee, that means that the special interests are, are going to buy you. And that's how you can get on, a, you know, that's how you get your campaign money to go back the next time. But I think uh, the way you get rid of Nancy Pelosi is to just not vote for her. That's all. So people need to, I mean, you know, if you look at what happened, if you, well, you have the electronic voting machines now, too. And they are a huge problem. I really didn't have any problem with my elections until we started voting on electronic voting machines. So this next one is for me from Ben Norris. Adam, does asking people to vote for you not defeat the purpose of freedom, which is you do not need to ask anybody for permission to be free, as that is like asking for your slave master for permission to be free? And this is, I'm, I'm really glad I got this question here because it's a challenge that I get, and it's, it's certainly uh, an appropriate one to address in the context of the platform that I'm proposing. And when we see that governments exist, to some degree, always with the consent of the governed, if you want to challenge that, you have to remove that consent one way or another. Mm -hmm. I'm an agorist. I believe in withdrawing our support in every material way possible from the state. I believe in civil disobedience. I think I've made that point perfectly clear. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to this platform, I think there's nothing more unlibertarian or anti-freedom that you can say other than, I want to be president of the United States. <laughs> So this platform, for me, is going in as a bankruptcy agent. The only thing I'm going to do as president, I plan on being president for, I don't know, 30 seconds, go and sign one executive order that declares the federal government completely bankrupt, of no authority whatsoever, and I resign to be custodian of the federal government as a bankruptcy agent for the purpose of carrying out a bankruptcy proceeding. And agorism, as beautiful as that is, will never end the state. You could get 95 plus percent of the population withdrawing their consent, and if 5% say they want to pay taxes and they want to support people pointing guns at you, if you don't do something to resist that, they will come after you. You can have a seastead in the middle of the ocean, and if the US empire is, is populated by nothing but sheeple who we've never reached, you're, now you're subject to America's foreign policy, and that's even worse. The first American constitutional presidential election, white land-owning males, Less than 2% of the population voted. And the government didn't say, oh, shucks, I guess we don't have a mandate. We better just go pack it in. No, they said, screw you, we're in charge, and we're going to start pointing guns at everybody. So what I'm doing with this campaign is not asking people to vote for me. We're about to put up an endorsement page on the website that says very clearly that it's an endorsement of the platform, that the American people can decide 
through the American presidential process that we are too good for this government and we don't need to be united <laughs> under yes. one government to be united in American values. When people go to vote in 2020, it'll be the first time in American history that we have a real choice to vote nobody for president. You're going to get to choose between an old party schmuck or this exact executive order that you'll be able to see on our website. You will know the plan. You will know exactly what you are voting for. None of this Nancy Pelosi. You can see what's in the bill after we pass it. Crap. No. It is going to be a very clear item that we're saying this is what it is and I'm going to sign this and we're going to carry out this plan and I will have no presidential authority whatsoever, only the authority of a bankruptcy agent. So what we are doing is using the American presidential election to host a referendum on whether or not the federal government should be allowed to continue to exist at all. To Cynthia, one of the things that was not talked about on 9-11 was the presence of Hurricane Aaron, a Category 3 hurricane just off the coast of New York on the morning of 9-11. Do you know of anything about Aaron and any involvement that that had anything relevant to 9-11? No. Um, I don't know anything about that. Um, I think what's more relevant are the more than eight war games that were going on. Um, the failure of the um, no, NORAD, yeah, the no-fly zone. Um, there were many, too many failures that happened on that day. And um, so a hurricane, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of pales in comparison to the human actions or none actions that took place on that day. All right, well, since we only have one minute left with Terry here, I have just a few notes that I want to give to wrap this up, and then we have one very final question here. And this is something that has been a concern for me in the movement, and it's something that I see about localization as a way forward, as something that unites us. We know that freedom itself unites us because it speaks to the core of our humanity, to the respect for that individual will. But even among people at this conference, we have our disagreements. We can't decide what these terms mean even that we use sometimes. But this idea of localizing government, of taking it apart from the top down, of getting that power restored to the community level, eventually to the individual where your rights are respected, where you can opt out, where everything that we have in our social institutions is voluntary, that unites people. And to me, this is so important that if we really want to achieve a voluntary society, we have to stop arguing principles. We have to stop arguing ideals and utopias and perfect situations. And I'm not saying that we have to give up or compromise our principles in any way whatsoever. But we make progress not by asking people to come to us, but by going to them and say, these are my principles. And this is how I have come up with practical policy that immediately improves everyone's lives. And in this movement, one of the things that we're looking forward to in the LP is bringing that decentralization. There's a lot of corruption in the Libertarian Party that needs to be addressed before this is going to be possible. But I want you to be thinking about what we can do with the culture of this movement to be more inviting, to be more inclusive, to be more encouraging of people who see this direction towards freedom that can unite us as an entire global human family. And we can live it. We can change the culture here in our movement. And first, a little plug here. How many of you all are on steamit.com? All right. Information freedom, blockchain-based, decentralized social media is critical to us realizing the potential of the internet. And one of the things that I wanted to do is to make this announcement publicly to say that I want to help everybody here get a leg up on Steemit. If you're starting from scratch, send me an email. I don't want you starting with zero followers. I want you to have a piece of that. I want, I want to encourage other voices. And this is the thing that I am most proud of 
in my entire 11 years of an activist is not the things that I have done, but the people who I have helped, the people who I have strengthened in their voices, the people who I have mentored and trained and lifted up. And I want to make that not, not an exception. I want to make that the default because I think that is how we behave when we are truly aligned and centered and living the values of freedom. And when we do that as a movement, not only will we able, be able to unite each other, ourselves as activists, but unite humanity in freedom. Thank you very much. McKinney. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, buddy. There was an idea to bring together a group of remarkable people. To see if we could become something more. So when they needed us, we could fight the battles. That they never could. time, the state will know what it's like to lose. To feel so desperately that it's right, yet to fail all the same. Dread it. Run from it. Freedom still arrives. Vacate the state. Engage all the speakers. And get this man a microphone. Fun isn't something that one considers when eradicating tyranny. <laughs> but this does put a smile on my face. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube, and you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at and we'll share it on my feed.